Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to those who've been here for a long time and those who are on their way in. You are not late. It's just that we're early. It's St. Swithin's Day today. That means that if it rains today, it's going to rain for the next 40 days. Now, of course, if you believe that, you'll believe anything. <laughs> and we're so grateful, aren't we, that we've come here to hear and to receive the word of God. Peter refers to it as the living and enduring word of God. And that we can believe and that we do believe. And so we're here for our second Bible reading, and I'm sure we've come with a feeling of great expectancy. God met with us in a special way yesterday, and we're quite sure that as we open our hearts to him, he's going to do the same again today. I have some notices again. Michael's just referred to them as the odds and ends. They're perhaps a little bit more important than that. First of all, the programme, I think most of you by now will have a programme. If you haven't, please do get a programme if you don't want to get lost and you want to find your way to wherever you have to be. A special word of apology to any parents who were not here on the first night and therefore didn't hear about the correction in the programme relating to the evening children's meetings. The evening children's meetings are all down in Rawnsley Hall and not at the back of the tent. We're sorry about that. It was a mistake that slipped in to the programme and we're sorry for those of you that have had any confusion. But from now on, you will know that the 8s to the 11s are down in the Rawnsley Hall in the evening. I'm asked to ask you whether you have your Keswick sweatshirt yet. Now, looking around the tent, I can't actually see one. Ah, <laughs> oh. it's really been too warm, hasn't it, to wear them, but maybe from now on, and there's a lady over there who will display hers to you afterwards so that you can see just how lovely they are and they're good value. They're in the convention office and you can buy one after this meeting. After this meeting, you can also meet the mountain goat people at the front there behind the Christian Service Centre, and um, they can uh, organise, they are organising tours in the area if you would like to travel with them, and the bookings can be made out there. Now, last night, Mark Smith got us all excited, I'm sure, when he shared with us the new project of the Rawnsley Hall, the school and there will be guided tours around there this afternoon and again on Thursday from 2.30 to 4 o'clock this afternoon. Now that doesn't mean that you will be touring for an hour and a half. What it means is that any time between then you can arrive and the actual tour, the actual time that you will spend there will be something between 20 to 30 minutes depending on when you come. It'll be a sort of ongoing program and um, there'll be a brief introductory tour, talk and then a tour of the building, which is expected to last about 20 minutes. So do go down and see just what it's, what it's all about. Lost property. Some of you have lost things. Maybe you don't know you have. We know you have because we have a box in the office. Do come and collect anything. And if you find anything that's clearly not yours and you think somebody's lost it, obviously please take it in there. This afternoon, there's a, what we call a mini-seminar. We hope it won't be that mini. It's in the Christian Service Centre behind there at 2.30, the title Cinderella or Superman. And the subtitle is What Place Does Mission Have in Your Local Church? A very vital subject. Do come and meet there. And this gives me an opportunity of just perhaps clarifying another piece of confusion is it the Christian service area, as this door says? Is it the Christian service center, as the program says? Or is it Christian vocations? Now, you can go in there and find the answer to all of that. But basically what it is, it is the Christian service center that was, that is now the Christian vocations, okay? 
If you're still not very clear, they'll explain it to you. Go in there and see them. And incidentally, while you're here at Keswick, please do, at some stage, make your way into the Christian Service Centre there, talk with the Christian Vocations people, and find out all that you can take back to your local church that will be of enormous benefit. This afternoon, there is another meeting going on here in the tent at 2.30, where Clive Calver will be speaking to us. Psalm 22 is the subject, and the subject once for all. I told you it was St. Swithin's Day. <laughs> it's not just St. Swithin's Day, it's a rather special day today, and I don't know whether Clive and Ruth are out there in the rain or whether they've made their way into the tent, but it's their silver wedding. Now they could have... Yes, they deserve a clap. They could have been anywhere, but they're here serving the Lord and serving us here at Keswick, and we thank them for coming. There's also a minister's meeting this afternoon at four o'clock in Southey Street Methodist Church, which is slightly different from previous years. Instead of having one of the speakers just speaking to the ministers, we thought it would be helpful if the ministers can provide the questions so that they know what they would like to hear addressed. So the ministers and their wives are invited. There will be a special meeting for ministers' wives and ministers in the broadest sense, evangelists, wife, people in Christian ministry, for their wives on Thursday afternoon with Myrtle Bourne. But this one is just for ministers and wives this afternoon. And we mentioned yesterday that we would like some questions. It's not a question of just coming and sort of throwing questions at them from the floor. It's, we would appreciate it if some questions could be part, handed in to the office immediately following this meeting. So please write your questions, ministers, and if you're intending to come and hear the answers, of course, then please do that and then you can come along and benefit from it. Then if you're still with it, by this evening at 7.45, our convention meeting with Mark Ashton, who will be speaking to us, going on in the study of Malachi. Come early, because there'll be plenty of opportunity for worship and praise if you come early. And the rain will have stopped, and there will also be, while we're here in the tent, an open-air meeting. Well, those are the end of the notes. That is the end of the notices, you'll be pleased to know. And yesterday, I took the opportunity of talking with Bishop Michael Bourne, and just getting to know him a little bit. He made the point that in a big conference it's not always easy to get to know the speakers. So I would ask Michael if he would just join me again here on the platform and we'll just take the story a little bit further. I'm hoping that this is working, is it? Yes. Thank you. It's great, isn't it, Michael, when you get clapped before you say anything? <laughs> Perhaps it was because of all that you said yesterday. You. Um, one of the things that Michael said yesterday when he was here, and I'd like to ask you about this, Michael, you talked about your conversion, you talked about finding Christ, and you said that you said to him, Lord, anything but the ministry. Hmm. So what happened? Well, I was quite sincere in that exception because I always thought that ministers and missionaries were people who sort of wore stained glass pyjamas and so on. They weren't, uh, they weren't normal human beings. Um, and uh, it took a long time, really, uh, for God to deal with that. In fact, I was called to the ministry in the notices. <laughs> the odds and ends. You just called them the odds and ends, <laughs> Because on one Sunday morning, our uh, vicar, um, Herbert Taylor, bless him, uh, stood up and said, next Sunday uh, in Rochester Cathedral, Peter Cottingham will be ordained deacon, etc., etc. And that took the brackets away, because I knew Peter was someone I'd mucked around with and rambled with and played games with, and he was an ordinary guy. And in that awesome moment, I realized that he was this lad who'd left school at 15 and gone out to work and so on. I was just as exposed as Peter. 
and that's when the brackets went. It still realize, took a little while to get it cleared, but there we are. You realise how ordinary they were. We had a yeah. missionary's conference. Still do, of course. <laughs> we had a missionary's conference in a secular hotel, and a chambermaid was overheard to say, they use real talcum powder. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly wasn't there, anyhow, but there we are. <laughs> use that. But you didn't go straight into the ministry. What did you do when you left school? Um, when I left school, I left school at uh, 15 and a half, but I took my matric at 14, so I was a bit young for it, really. And then um, went out into an accountant's firm to start with, which was one of the foulest places I've ever been in my life. And then into banking, then into the army and the Royal Signals, and then back into banking again. And then after that? After that, yes. I mean, uh, in the end, I, I waited for God to clarify. I wanted God to clarify this for me about the call. Um, uh, uh, because he'd taken the brackets away and I was therefore wide open for him to come and write me a letter to say what I should do next. Um, and we had various meetings, we had people there about vocation and so on come to the church and I expected it to happen like that. But it happened late one night, very early in January. In those days we were hand ledgers in the bank and uh, anyone who worked in banking there knew what New Year's Eve meant. You met, you were up all night, really, and it was actually either New Year's Eve or, or just after New Year's Day. It was still very late back from the bank. We had relatives. We lived in a small house. I was downstairs sleeping on the settee, and uh, I read the portion from Oswald Chambers for that night, uh, late at night, about one o'clock in the morning, in fact. And uh, he basically took the Isaiah passage, whom shall I send, uh, here am I, send me. And he said, uh, God did not call Isaiah. What? No, he said he didn't. Isaiah overheard him saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And because he became attuned to the call that he couldn't escape, he said, here am I, send me. And basically, what Oswald Chambers says, although reading it now again, it's how God interpreted it to me at the time. It's slightly different in the book. He said, uh, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting for an angelic messenger to come at the end of your bed and say, I want you in the ministry? And I said, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Well, then he said, basically, but has the call been pounding into your mind for months and months, and no, you, you can't escape it? And of course, I knew that it hadn't been happening for a year and a half, uh, or a year or so, whatever it was. And I said yes, and I slipped out of bed and off the settee and onto my knees. And I'm not a person who has particularly mystical experiences too often, but that little lounge in Orpington was filled with light. And I knew God had called me. Great. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Well, we'll hear more from you tomorrow, I'm, I'm sure. And shortly we're going to hear God's word expounded to us. But before we do that, we're going to sing. We're going to sing another prayer, Master Speak. And then Philip Hacking, who doesn't need any introduction to the Keswick congregation, I'm quite sure, is going to come and read a passage of scripture to us, which Michael will be expounding later, and he will lead us in a word of prayer. But first of all, we'll stand and sing num number 73 if you're using the books, otherwise on your screens, Master Speak, and again, it's a personal prayer. Speak to me by name, O oh Master, let me know it is to me. So we'll stand and sing, Master Speak, Philip will lead us and then over to Michael.
Please take your Bibles and find James chapter 1. I'm going to read the first half of the passage Michael's dealing with, and verses 19 to 27 of chapter 1 is that passage. We've just sung a prayer, so I'll read the word and just very briefly turn it into a very obvious prayer. James 1, 19. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do it, what it says, is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he'll be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Let's suggest we'll almost pray with the Bible open in front of us, just turning those words into prayer. Father, we've got the mirror in front of us. We now want to be those who actually take note of what we see and then do it. Grant to your servant, Michael, as he, as it were, holds the mirror up more closely so that we can see ourselves more clearly. Help him. And help us all, whatever our position in life and service may be, for those who do listen, and listen intently, and then have the grace to do it, so that we may be blessed, your church enriched, your name glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my friends, my sisters and brothers, just to lift James slightly, when he says, my dear brothers, he's always starting a new section, and he does that for us this morning. When I used to go to CSSM uh, beach missions, it was always bros and lady bros. Some of you remember all that? We've come on a bit since then. Well, this is a very practical passage. It's a very demanding passage this morning. Some of you will have heard me mention before that uh, when we were in one church, it'll need to be nameless, it was quite a long time ago, there was a group of people who thought they were wonderful do-gooders. They were the sort of people who went around making a lot of noise about what they were doing, collecting money from other people and giving it to people with great trumpeting and regarding themselves as the best people around. In fact, what they did could have been done by most Christians in about five hours. But uh, on one of these, uh, they were so proud of themselves, some of them, and one of them said to me one day, we've just come back from holiday. And uh, he said, the sun shone the whole time. See, that's what the Bible says, Rector, isn't it? The sun shines on the righteous. <laughs> and he wasn't being funny. It's the nearest I've ever got to kicking a member of my congregation on the shins. <laughs> James would have done so. <laughs> I was able, however, to remind him that the scripture said that the sun shines on the unrighteous and the righteous and the rain on the good and the evil. Because the rain was the blessing. However, he wasn't satisfied with that. 
So we come first to this passage up to the end of chapter 1, which is a tremendously challenging passage, enough for three sermons and a whole week of Bible readings. It is the whole business about not reacting and needing to be changed. We sit in this lovely place, uh, in this tent, in this glorious part of the world. But go and stand on the west bank of Jerusalem now, or stand as a Christian in an Islamic fundamentalist country. Try and be a Christian in Afghanistan at the moment. Try and be a Christian in some of the appalling parts of the world where to live is difficult. Be one in Cambodia. Wherever we think about the, the trouble spots of the world, we are coming near to the situation in Jerusalem where there was oppression, as we have heard the other day, where the aristocracy oppressed the poor, where there was the Roman rule, where if you were poor and downtrodden, you felt you were powerless in that situation, and you only had to have someone who began to be a rabble raiser, of the zealots, as they were called, who came around and said, come on, now's the time to get up and fight. You join us, and we're going to win by guerrilla warfare, by killing the aristocracy, by acting in this way. That was the situation. And the whole business of James is to try and moderate that back, to hold that back. And the message goes on and on and on and on. Here we are 2,000 years later with similar situations all over the world. The world doesn't change because man is always a sinner. It's quite right, I think, that this government should remind themselves of the great uh, quotes of earlier days, that the trouble, uh, as one leading socialist philosopher said, the trouble with all our utopian schemes uh, is that man is a sinner and he wrecks everything we plan. And we are in this situation wherever we are and whoever we are. And so there is a great tendency to be whipped up and to hear only those who whip you up so that you become more and more bigoted. Think of the bigotry that there is in Northern Ireland as well as the wonderful Christians who seek to cross the divide. But you whip up the bigotry. You only hear what your side says to you and what you want to hear. And these situations are very real ones into which James is speaking as someone who is there, the head of the church in the city where it's happening. And if you don't know your history, I should remind you that uh, in AD 70, because of the zealots, Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, and the zealots themselves were forced to the last stand on Masada. It did end in the way in which James warned it would happen, because they didn't heed him. So he says, do not react, be changed. And this is a very big situation when you're feeling yourself to be powerless. Last year, I was in hospital after um, an appendix operation. And uh, I read Nelson Mandela's book, The Long Walk to Freedom. Some of you may have read that book. It's a very moving book, a very challenging book, a very informative book. But I found myself wrestling in my own mind whether it was right that he had gone into terrorism in order to achieve the results in South Africa, for which, of course, he was put in prison. And as I talked and thought about that and looked at James, where James doesn't seem to recommend that should be the case, I talked with some of the sisters who live next door to us in Chester, the community of the Holy Name, who had worked in Soweto. And when I said it to them, they said, you should have lived in Soweto, you wouldn't say that then. And precisely, of course, when you live in a situation, you tend to see things very differently, uh, as in Rwanda or elsewhere. But I do know that in many parts of the country, and not least in the diocese where I worked, in parts of Merseyside and other places like that, there were places where people felt utterly powerless, utterly frustrated and oppressed in the day in which we live. And these were serious things to have to face as a Christian. And you could understand people with a sort of anger. Well, we say we're not in that situation ourselves. Well, yes and no. Because quite often we do find ourselves cornered by circumstances or by problems. The more I meet and talk with people, even here at the convention, I find that there is a huge amount of pain here in this convention. There are people suffering, people just divorced who spoke, who are hurt beyond measure by what's happened. People who've been left single and other people who feel themselves faced by other circumstances of poverty and so on. There's a lot of pain. And very often in these difficult circumstances, we're likely to want to react unless we keep, as this passage says here, with the word implanted in our hearts time and time again, accepting the word, accepting the word. But to verse 19 surely must be to every one of us here that we should be quick to listen 
slow to speak and slow to become angry. I need to, I mean, to have that written in the Bible and, and, and to hear it and to hear it and to hear it. However much it's been done to me, I still know how easy it is for me to do it to other people. Suddenly to see something in the newspaper, not to check it, not in any way to see what lies behind it, and then to say, look at that. Instead of wanting to know what the truth is, as a Christian, I should be concerned about the truth, not about the way in which truth is so often twisted or something taken out of context. And yet we go on doing it, don't we? We all do. And I have to put the brakes onto myself. People ring me up and used to ring me up and, and say, come on, so-and-so said this. And uh, what is your reaction? At first I would do it, and then it would be printed. And then I'd find out that what they were saying the person had said was not what they had actually said. And so now I ask them to ring me back until I can check and get the transcript. Or I say, I will not answer until you give me the full transcript of what that person has said. But it isn't easy to learn that, to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. The founder of Stoicism said that human beings have two ears and one mouth, that they may hear twice as much as they speak. And that's not a bad guide. And, and because of the way in which this can so open up things, the careless word, as King, Hed King Herod and Salome will remember, or Gerald Ratner will forever in the rest of his life, <laughs> the careless word can, as we will hear later, of course, about the tongue tomorrow, uh, can set a whole fire going. So verse 20 says, man's anger uh, does not, I forgot to put my time on, man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And so the zealots wanted to attack the Roman and their vessels and their vassals, but James wants them to be peacemakers. And he says later in chapter 3 and verse 18 that they should be peacemakers who sow in peace and raise a harvest of righteousness. It's one of those things that we find even in the fight for the faith that you can be very aggressive in the fight if you're not careful. You get very strong about the things people are doing. And then you read a passage like 2 Corinthians 10 that says, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ... These are our weapons, not the weapons of the world, with the word and the spirit and the gentleness of Christ. And do you know, this is the way it says we demolish strongholds. And do you know what the word demolish is? It's the same word as taking the body down of Jesus from the cross. They didn't do that aggressively, they did it gently. And so often you lose, you may win an argument, but you lose the point if you're aggressive rather than come with the strength of conviction but with the gentleness of Christ in the way in which it's presented. And so there are great issues that I think many of us are affected by in our daily lives. And verse 21 warns us to get rid of all moral filth. Well, of course, we don't want vulgarity and foul words. But it, it is this, of course, which is often associated with anger. What we need, as he says here, is the word implanted, and not thus that, but to accept the word implanted, to live under the word, to submit to the word, to let it grow in us and be watered by God and developed by God and, and blessed by the Spirit, till day after day after day after day after day after day, the word of God is affecting us and molding us and changing us. Uh, either... Uh, I mean, if we're not changing as Christians, there's something radically wrong with us, isn't there? You've probably heard me say before, I think elderly Christians, and I'm one of them, or elderly people for that matter, um, I'm in that category now, are like Chinese pork, you're either sweet or sour. <laughs> if you're sour, you're an absolute menace to the church. Because younger Christians say, that's what they like after being in the church for 40 years. And if you're a sweet, elderly Christian, like all of you are here, of course, <laughs> then people say, how wonderful, look at that lovely person, always wanting to encourage the young and wanting the best to go forward for the Lord Jesus. Uh, which are you? Now, you see, people say, well, he's always been like that. He's always had a temper for the last 40 years. Well, he shouldn't. He shouldn't. Because if the word of God is implanted within us, we should be changing. Yes, slowly. Yes, it's a fight. Yes, the sinful nature is within us. And yes, the grace of God is within us. But this is the aim. And so there's a great need for all of us here to hear the first bit of this, uh, to be uh, people who have this word planted in us, affecting us. And then do not just listen, but act on what you hear, he says, in these next verses, 22 to 25. Now, it's very easy to be a good listener. 
and not to do more. You can listen to sermons and Bible expositions and addresses at, Ken at Keswick. You can discuss sermons. You can roast the preacher. You can read Christian books. You can do theological degrees, but nothing happens. Nothing happens. Uh, and there's this, not the change that we were thinking about just now, because you have to be someone, verse 25, who looks intently, who looks intently. This means gazes, meditates. It's not a matter of, oh, I've done my SU portion for today, off I go. Unless you stop and meditate, unless at lunchtime you can think, oh, yes, that's what God said to me this morning. Unless at tea time you can say, yeah, oh, yeah, now I'm beginning to see more of it. Unless you've done that, you haven't meditated, you haven't thought, you haven't let the word get in here. You looked at it, and as of course it says here, and gone away, like looking into the mirror and going away again. Now, now I know that uh, sometimes when you look into the mirror, you're glad to go away again and forget what's there. <laughs> Speaking for myself, not for all you lovely ladies here, but I think the men anyhow, particularly. But sometimes you do that with the word, you look at it, and it's too convicting to take it seriously, so you forget it and go away again. And yet the word has to be challenging. It has to be something which reaches us. And, and so often today, in the day in which we live, in many young Christians, the word is a long way from their daily lives. They're a long way from actually the discipline of scripture that many of you here and, and us here were brought up on. And that is going to be a desperately dangerous situation in the years to come. To be changed by the word. He will bless you, it says, if you do this, you're more likely to be in tune with God. And look in verse 25, he speaks of the perfect law. And we were thinking of that, some of us, on Sunday afternoon about Psalm 19. The perfect law because it reflects the perfection of God. And on Sunday afternoon I was saying how C.S. Lewis found it very difficult to speak of the law as sweeter than honey as the psalmist does until he saw that the law of God, and of course for us the whole word of God, is the outline of the perfect way to live. And when you come nearer and nearer to the perfection God wants, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect in, in the Sermon on the Mount, the more you find the smoothness of the running of the life that God has given you. Uh, and so there is a very great sense in which you look into the perfect law, which is of course the New Testament fulfillment of that. And when you do that, you are challenged by it. After all, in Matthew 5, and of course James is quoting uh, his brother, the Lord, time and time again, you actually are to love your enemies. And you are so to love them that you overcome evil with good. I mean, that is quite something. Some of us can't even love our friends, let alone our enemies. And the Sermon on the Mount perhaps ought to be a constant reading in our lives. Because it's not just murder, but anger with your brother. And there's so much of this around in the Christian church. In fact, some of the church newspapers, I think of perhaps the Church Times, particularly the Church of England newspaper that I used to have to read. Uh, no disrespect <laughs> to the editors particularly. But in the end, I had to keep them in the kitchen because they so upset me that if they went out of the kitchen and got near the bedroom, I wouldn't sleep all night. And the greatest thing I did at the end of August was to give them up for a year. I'll have to take them again, I suppose, now, but there we are. <laughs> because so many people are slanging each other. And I look back to Matthew 5 and say, this is so far from the perfect law. This doesn't reflect Christ. And so, C, do not have a worthless religion. Now, this is religion as James interprets it, not as Oasis interprets it uh, last night. This is a religion that is either worthless or worthwhile. And, of course, he touches on these elements that he's going to take out later on. He touches on the tongue. And in particular, he's touching on the zealots who whip people up and, and get them just listening to their voice and not to listen to a balanced presentation. And in this way, they are twisted and turned uh, to, to become people who go behind this group. And you see it happening in all sorts of parts of the world. Um, but for many of us, it's not necessarily that. It is the fact that we find it very difficult to control our tongue. Don't we? I mean, the time I've, as you get older, you think back upon all the things you wish had never happened in your life. And very often it's a tongue. It's something quite quick that you wish you had never, ever said. And it may only just be a remark. And it came just off the shoulder and is misinterpreted, but you wish you hadn't said it. The tongue. But it says here, if you can't control the tongue, Ah, 
Well, yes and no. Of course, we wrestle all the time with this. But some people say, I can't. There's no such word in the Bible. Philippians 4 is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How many of you were brought up with that as a regular text in your mind? Many of you here, weren't you? It was always, in fact, it was the, 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 one of the choruses in youth praise um, banged out on the A10. I call it the A10 chorus because I banged it out while I was driving and rushed into High Lee to write it down. I can do all things through... No, I mean, never mind. <laughs> you don't hear these texts. I am crucified with Christ. We were brought up in them. They were the very center of Keswick and of conviction. Now it's so much onto experience what I should feel like. But I am crucified with Christ. Yet I live because Christ lives in me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hallelujah. And so we cannot say I can't. But we need to fight it, fight it, fight it. Knowing that so often it is the words of our mouth as well as our lives that let down the Lord Jesus. God forgive us. And then caring action. Of course, we're going to come back to this as well. It is discovering his will in our lives. It is real action, not as uh, George Tyrrell put it, and like the person I quoted at the beginning this morning, the kind of going out, doing good, which is chiefly going about. We all suffer from those people. Do-gooders, in the wrong sense of the term. But this is goodness because the heart is filled with love and with a desire to reach people and touch people. And he reaches out onto examples in his own time. The force of verse 27 is not that this is the sum of religious action that he lists here, but in his time, these were some of the staring problems that needed to be faced. Do you understand that? It's no good coming back and saying the Bible says we've got to do these things and that will be pure religion. This is an example of the way in which there and then there was practical action in the midst of Jerusalem. And uh, he calls us... Um, to this practical action together. Now, uh, both these particular groups were people who bore particular suffering at that time. You remember in Acts 6, the widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And there was a great desire to care for those who had no one to care for them in 1 Timothy 5. So it was an important issue in the church of the day. But for many of us, it is how to apply the Lord Jesus' love to the sections of society in which we live at home and abroad. I mean, it's a long time back when, when I was being brought up as a Christian, but there wasn't much of this in my upbringing in the Christian church. And we needed the breakthrough with things like tear fund and so on to start blowing our minds into the way in which we are having to face the needs of the world. We reacted because we said there's a social gospel. Um, and we don't want anything to do with that. We just want the true gospel. But as I should be saying later on this morning, the 19th century evangelicals led in both. Uh, and and we've, we've stored it to some extent. And when you go and touch the needs of society with the love of Christ, I mean, Myrtle and I were able to go out and see Operation Christmas Child in Bosnia while the war was actually going on, where the shelling was going on. It was a dangerous mission. The notice boards in Chester said, Bishop goes on danger mission. And it, uh, frankly, it was. But nonetheless, we were there, uh, and in the name of Christ, in the Muslim community, bringing aid, which was thrilling to do. Uh, and, and you saw and felt what it was really like to be there with no bank, no, no money, no post office, nothing. The people who remained there serving were doing it for nothing, and they could have got out. It was very moving to see what people would do. And we have to say to ourselves, what is the great need? William Booth said about money, we will wash it in the tears of the widows and orphans and lay it on the altar of humanity. Just a few weeks ago, um, I was um, at Harrow School to speak there, nine o'clock at night, to the boys in the chapel, marched in. Um, but just before that, I met up with a chaplain at 35 West Street. And he told me this is the place where the young Lord Ashley, who became Shaftesbury, the Earl of Shaftesbury, was at school at Harrow. And it was from this house that he stepped out from 35 West Street and saw the pauper's funeral going up that steep, steep hill to the church, or the churchyard. And, and Shaftesbury, or the long, young Lord Ashley, was so horrified by the sight that there and then he dedicated his whole life to the cause of the poor and the friendless. And he did it, of course, 
with the passion of the Lord Jesus. And later, when he became the Earl of Shaftesbury and in Parliament, he weighed in about the terrible conditions in mental asylums and the fate of children in industrial towns where five-year-olds were even being made to stand up all day at machines for 14 hours at five years of age. And it was people like Shaftesbury who, in the name of Christ, with a passion for the real gospel of the Lord Jesus, reached out and spoke out with, with great courage about the terrible conditions in the mines and of the chimney sweeps. And so there has often been in our history many people for the cause of Christ who have tackled slavery and all the rest of it. Uh, and we live today in this day, and we say to ourselves, what is the issue where we live, where you live, my friends? Now, when we worked at All Souls in London, we, just, we, we resolved that you can't meet every condition at that time that we were there. But the one major social condition in the centre of London is loneliness. And we sought to address that first. Other things have followed on. So ask yourselves, what is it in this area where in the name of Christ we can move? There must be something. We pioneered as Christians over hospitals and over hospices and over so many other things. And then there's holiness here, to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. And again, of course, a, a real Christian wants to avoid that pollution, which is so subtle to all of us in the present day. Again, when I was at All Souls, we had uh, one evening um, uh, an event for the media uh, when we had the head of um, the BBC at that time and of the ITV at, the, at that time, and we had a lecture by Malcolm Muggeridge. And um, in that very large assembly of people with all these people from the media there, including the top people, Malcolm Muggeridge turned on them and said, television is like the experiment of the frog in the water that you gradually heat the water and the frog doesn't know it's getting warmer until it expires. And he turned on the leaders of the media and said, that's exactly what you're doing to this country. You are affecting, affecting, infecting the morals and the way in which people think and act and this country doesn't realize what you're doing to it until it will be too late. And that was, what, 18 years ago. How true he was. But Boy, did the balloon go up after that. <laughs> These guys were out of their seats with absolute anger. But I believe Muggeridge is right. We're all affected by the media. And so is the world. And so we have this very great challenge to real religion here. We haven't time to take it further. But it is a challenge to be practical. It was Mother Teresa at the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, was it a year or two ago, uh, who spoke at it. And she was commending love, and they were all nodding approvingly. Then she spoke powerfully against abortion. Not physically correct, not politically correct in America to speak about that at a public meeting or a national prayer breakfast. Uh, you're supposed to avoid controversy. Some applauded, some sat in stony silence. And then this little figure leaned forward to the microphone and said, if you don't want the children, Give them to me. I'll take them. And she spread her arms wide. And the whole assembly stood and applauded her. Because she does not believe in worthless religion. Do you want a breather? Let's have a minute just to stand up, because that was hard stuff. Uh, two minutes max. Stand up, turn around, take a breather, sit back on these comfortable chairs. Um, <laughs> two minutes. Is that um, that uh, the 50 minutes is actually quite a long time to sit on a chair. It's not so bad if it's light, but to, 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 James is pretty demanding, so we may have to do it every morning. We'll just see how you go. <laughs> but we also move into a good chapter break because uh, my brother starts the next section at chapter two, and this means it's a fresh section, probably a totally fresh sermon. As we say, all these are, are little sermon things in, and that is why we keep coming back over the same themes. Now, we've left, religion isn't actually mentioned again from now on. Uh, we start this passage with this 
title as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Now we say, wow, that's what, of course, that's what I sing, the glorious Lord Jesus, hallelujah. Yes, it's a wonderful phrase, but it isn't just an enthusiastic phrase. It's a little bit more than that. Take it in the Greek. The Greek is the Lord Jesus Christ of glory. That's literally how he wrote it. The Lord Jesus Christ of glory. Now we say, okay, we think of passages like the Transfiguration, they saw his glory, or uh, Hebrews 1, the radiance of God's glory, or John 1, we have seen his glory, the glory, etc. Yeah, we could quote a lot of passages like that, but just remember, you're standing alongside James, who's standing alongside Jesus. And what I've quoted is what other people are talking about in their description. How did our Lord use it? Well, he used it, for instance, in Matthew 24. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. He used it in Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats before him. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory and all the nations will be gathered before him. In fact, when our Lord uses it primarily, it's about judgment. And what underlies all the way through this epistle, in fact, the more you read it, the more you see it, is his sense that this life is also, though we're saved by grace, is going also to be judged for the ways his servants we have lived. Not that salvation depends on it, but it is part of the judgment at the end. And this, therefore, becomes a title of reminder. And reminder also, perhaps, an implication of the way in which the Lord became the Lord of glory, that he came as a suffering servant, that he identified with those who are misunderstood. He identified with those in poverty, for he never possessed anything. He identified with those who suffer in the world in which we are. He identified with powerful authorities like the Roman and Jewish authorities acting against you. Suddenly, he identifies with so many sections of the society in which we are. And his pathway was not one of aggression, but of crucifixion, of self-giving, of supreme sacrificial love. And thus, underneath that title, the glorious Lord Jesus, there is a tremendous significance. So he goes on to say, don't show favoritism. Now, this is a, a major aspect of double-think with many of us. The word is a three-part Greek word that means to the face receiving. If I look into that camera, you should get it. To the face receiving. <laughs> and so if you took a quick glance down through the camera, you'd see this not a pretty face, but not just a pretty face. You could say he's got a green jacket on, and so on. You can look at the outside. But that's what James is at. We so often only look at the outside. And this is what he's on about. Um, I wonder whether you saw that uh, little bit, uh, there was something, a uh, little program, in which they sent someone to purchase a car wearing very old uh, clothes and driving a clapped out old banger. And he turned up at this posh, car showroom, and they, no, no salesman would even come out to see him, I mean, eventually, reluctantly. Then he went back and changed into a Hugo Boss suit, and came in in a Jag or something, and they all rushed out to serve him. And then there was another one where a lady reporter went to a market stall, or a, a, a greengrocer's, you may have seen, and put on old clothes and dressed up as an old lady, and she was swept aside and told they hadn't got whatever it was she asked for. Then she went back dressed to kill, you know smart, modern, young dress, when they pawned over and, and found what she wanted. Ah. We say, yeah, that's what the world's like. Really? Not you? Not me? I'm afraid there is that in all of us. In 1 Samuel 16, the choice of Jesse's sons uh, for the king, the tall guy, impressive, surely this must be him, says Samuel. No, says God. Then they have this lad from the hills who's looking after the sheep. And God says, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And down through my history in dealing with youngsters in Bible classes and so on, you think, God, these, are, these, these three are terrific, you know. And, well, they're not so good, those. 
and the not-so-good ones now stand as men and women in Christ, and the others are nowhere. Lord, forgive me. Don't look on the outward appearance. See through the outside. The, the story of Sir Frederick Traves and the elephant man and seeing John Merrick, that young fellow underneath that foul skin, always challenges me. A man who looks straight through to the other side and sees people as they really are. And yet we are affected, deeply affected. We say we don't believe that we want to treat anybody differently, whatever the colour of their skin or background. But there's something very deep in us. And Nelson Mandela admits in his book, A Long Walk to Freedom, that later, after he was freed and after he was travelling the world uh, in, in to, uh, to tell what was happening, he actually went on a plane in Kenya and saw the pilot was black and immediately felt unsafe. And he said, you see, even in me, with the colour of the skin the same, I still had endemic within me the feeling that the black man is inferior to the white. It goes very deep in all of us. And you know that it was um, Desmond Tutu who said about apartheid that it's not just uh, evil, it's blasphemy. Because if you believe every other human being is made in the image of God, then to treat them differently because of the colour of their skin is blasphemy. And it's a very challenging statement. So favouritism is something which I'm afraid is very deep within many of us. And there was a thing in the Evening Standard at the time of the election with nine faces of um, uh, Tony Blair varying from the swish suit down to the cloth cap and all the rest of it and said, supposing one of these other faces had been projected, would he still be Prime Minister? <laughs> now, there's no disrespect to him, but just the point is that we often judge by the appearance, and we still do so. So uh, what is behind all this is Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19.15 says this, Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Now listen, not partiality to the poor, nor favoritism to the great. Bias to the poor is not a biblical injunction except where there is a bias to the rich. And the reason there is a bias to the poor in this passage and needs to be in much of our world today is because so often the bias is to the rich and powerful. But the Bible says, in essence, before God, we should not show any partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, because before God, they all stand the same. That's what the ideal is. And that's the same passage in which we have, love your neighbor as yourself, which quotes, is quoted here. And so it's obviously behind this passage here uh, from James. Now, it's an important word, this word about um, favoritism. It's, the, it's actually not a word that occurs in secular Greek at all. It comes up in the New Testament only. It's a special word that's used here, but it's used elsewhere. It's used in Romans 2, for instance, that God's judgment is on the Jew and Gentile alike, for God does not show favoritism. It's there in Ephesians 6 about masters and slaves. It says to the masters, do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. You will stand the same. You will both be stripped of whatever you are and you will stand naked, as it were, before God. Whether you are the highest in the land or the lowest in the land. Whether you are a king or a prospective king or the ordinary commoner. Whoever you are, all that will go. And it's something that really, uh, I think, Peter helps us, although the word is uh, different that he actually uses, but it's in that Acts 10 thing when he has the, the vision, you remember, on the roof at, on, in the middle of the day on the roof of his house and the vision of the unclean animals and the, and the command, rise up and eat, and says, I won't eat any unclean thing. When God has to deal with him about that. And Peter then later says, I never realized till now how true it is. Uh, and, and he begins to dawn on something that's been part of his makeup and bringing up that he hadn't actually challenged. It's so easy for that. There are things in all of us that we grew up with from our childhood. I still hear my mother. Uh, you know, I still react as she does to, to some things. But it's okay. It's quite good in some ways. But, but there are deep things within us uh, that are part of our makeup. And so it's important for us really to challenge ourselves time and time again. We need to look both at the poor and the rich. We had to deal with both all across the spectrum in our Diocese of Chester. We dealt from those in sheer powerless poverty to those who said, don't you go to the races, Bishop? Everybody goes to the races, who matters? Blah, blah. 
that I can tell you we wept as much for some of the gentry as we did for some of the poor, who are flounderingly helpless without the knowledge of Jesus Christ and dipping into all sorts of ridiculous other things. And, and so it's not, not easy. It's not easy at the door of the church if you have different sorts of people coming towards you. Can you actually look through the external? We used to have a chap when we worked at Platt. Some of you from there will remember we called him Stinker. Boy, he didn't laugh. Um, <laughs> Bless his cotton, but he came to church. And the young people sat round him to, to look after him. And they were very brave in some of the things that happened. But this is part of life. Are we people who can look through the outside? Look through the wrinkles of the elderly if you're young? Or look through this exuberant person with a punk haircut? What's it matter? That you wish you had one too, really. <laughs> Especially the hair. Then there comes this possible scenario in verses 2 to 4. This scenario. Um, he's had the overture, now he gets down to it. So someone comes to your meeting. Now the word is synagogue, actually, in the Greek here. But they used it for meetings for worship as well as legal hearings. And uh, obviously we wouldn't want to apply it in that way. But in the midst of this situation, in the courts of those days, and this is what verse 3 is about, judges could make one person stand and one person sit. Now those of you in business know the game. Um, you have the big chair behind the desk and you sit the person lower in front of you in order that you're in the power position. And you sit preferably with a window behind you so they can't see your face. Now we still play that game. We still play it. And they played it then. They could say, you stand, you sit. So there was immediately an advantage. And then about clothes. By the second century AD, the Jewish rabbis ordered that both parties in legal hearings should wear the same clothes. Well, I mean the same sort of clothes. <laughs> so one didn't have the advantage of being in a Hugo Boss suit, or whatever they were in those days, and the other guy in poverty-stricken clothes. Because people would immediately go for the nicely dressed person. So they were being fair, that was second century, so they must have listened to James a bit. But especially for us, in worship and meetings, how much can we give attention to this person or not that person, or judge because they're wearing this or not wearing that? Our son uh, Andrew and his, uh, and his wife were at uh, a church somewhere, and I not say where it was now, they were on holiday, and they were in jeans, and behind them two ladies said, how absolutely disgraceful, coming to church in jeans. He wanted to turn around and say, and I'm a bishop's son too, but he didn't. <laughs> well, we notice the sort of welcomes that you receive, and sometimes we're, we're frightening. We're so sophisticatedly posh at the front of our churches that we frighten many ordinary people off. This is why one of the church wardens when I was at All Souls, who was a consultant, used to wear, never wear a suit on Sunday to make the students feel more welcome. And when we first went to All Souls, we thought, what on earth have we walked into with all these people very poshly dressed at uh, that point? And then this lad came in in an Afghan ragged coat and long hair, and we thought, hallelujah. <laughs> at least we've got some. And, of course, they were wonderful people underneath. We shouldn't have judged the others on the, on the outside. Well, my friends, look, 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 look at the people around you. Seek to welcome and look out for the person that's there, the lonely person, the person in need. We so often, if you go to a strange church as a visitor, don't you often find it difficult if you're invited to coffee to break into the clumps of little Christians talking with each other? Well, remember it the other way around. Then the gold rings of verse 2 were worn by the Roman Senate. So this was people who had power, therefore you put them in the best position in the hope you might have a favour out of them. How easy it is to do that. There's a distinction about differing members who need, uh, 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 and, and, and regarding them differently. And we need to act on that because verse 4 says, we become judges with evil thoughts. This is wrong. Douglas Webster says, the church must be a competition-free zone where instead of courting one another's favor, we rejoice together in God's favor. And how true that is. It's a very important thing. Do we therefore still give respect to a queen or a mayor or for that matter, a bishop and so on? Well, you're respecting the office, and that's different from respecting the person. And I think it is. There is a correction about that. I mean, uh, probably people will wear a hat and the right things when they go to the garden party today. But there is a fearing the Lord and the King in Proverbs 24 and showing proper respect to everyone in 1 Peter 2. So we don't just go too much the other way, but we need to be careful about it. 
And those of us who have authority need to reach out. I love the story of the Queen Mother at a meal, where the guy sitting at the table with her, there were several people at the table, picked up the finger bowl and drank from it. And you know what the Queen Mother did? Did the same. Fourthly, bias to the poor, verses 5 to 6. We've already said that this is balancing the bias to the rich and powerful, that is. And God sees the poor here as often rich in faith, in verse 5. That's why we had that song just now. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich, because of what the Lord has done for me. Yes, Old Testament, but into New Testament here as well. He looks through the outside, and how wonderful it is. Not that anyone is outside God's mercy. I have to keep reminding myself time and time again as I work with them and, live, and often have met with them that the rich, bless them, are very nice people, but they're often in great need of the Lord Jesus and, when they, and they can come to the Lord Jesus. So it's a great, the big ministry to do to such people as well as to the poor. And yet there is a great need to reach to all sorts and conditions of people. In the Roman courts, they favoured the rich. The rich could afford to take legal action. In fact, they were allowed to take legal action against inferior people. But the lower classes could not take legal action against the rich. They weren't allowed to. They weren't allowed to. Now, what about it today? If you heard the wireless this morning, you heard the Lord um, uh, Chancellor uh, describing some of the fees of some of those in the legal profession and saying this stops many people going to law. Of course it does. We say, this was 2,000 years ago, was it? You go to law today, would you dare to go to law unless you had a lot of money behind you or who could get proper legal aid? You see, many things go as injustices throughout our own country because still, if you have the money, you can go to law or if you've got a big company or a big newspaper behind you, you can go to law, but if you're an individual, you often can't. So we're still in this sort of power injustice game, although it's different from them, uh, from that day. It isn't a level playing field in our own country. And we need to see this, because often it's those, even in the New Testament times, you see, it was often the aristocracy who stirred things up in Pisidian Antioch. The Jews, it says, incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city, and they stirred up the persecution against Paul and Barnabas. Didn't do it direct. They got at the top people and made them do it because they had the power to do it. Lord, help us in this situation. It's not easy. But God's, what, and James wants us to see as Jesus sees. He sees the weak and poor as rich in faith. He sees, verse 5, that they inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. There is the echoes of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. There's the message of Nazareth and the reading in the synagogue of Luke 4. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. This is part of our commission and part of our responsibility as people. And wherever we are, we need to face it, and particularly in the societies around us. If you live in a very nice, comfortable area, okay, that's very nice. But then you and your church should be very closely involved with a community of Christians in a difficult area. Not patronizing, but in partnership. You're going to learn from them as well. And go and visit and share. Reach out. Don't just pull in. In fact, when I was going round my diocese, first of all in the inner parts of Birkenhead, where the thing in the particular part I was in was really desperate, and the situation appalling, really, uh, and uh, the man standing next to me, who was a high up in, in, in our country, said, then the church should pull out of this area. And I said, look, I'm an Anglican bishop. Wherever you live in this country, you're in a parish. We don't pull out, we pull in. And we raised a million pounds to rebuild the church right there for Jesus in that place. Because we have a responsibility. And uh, in some of our parishes, they, they said, Whoa, you don't want to give anything to people in Birkenhead. My husband used to be there. And they were all layabouts there. You don't give anything from this country parish. <laughs> and in other parishes, they said, Come on, let's go and visit. And they went. And two of their cars were vandalized during the visit. But they met love. They were overwhelmed by love. And they gave and they gave because they suddenly saw that this was their responsibility, bless them. So in practical terms, it means mission not just to the educated, but to the non-book culture, and thinking about that in changing church programs very often. It means affirming the richness of faith 
in, in ordinary people. Think of the great testimonies of people who've never had education, who just love the Lord Jesus. They've got more to teach us than many others. It means social care and action. It means things like action that evangelical parishes have started, credit unions, practical help about finance, the parishes that have a furniture store for Jesus uh, to help those in the poverty area, and clothing stores. They're in action for Jesus. They want to reach out and, and preach the gospel and act for the Lord Jesus. Involvement in so many different ways, in political causes, which we had a, a, an opportunity to do, many of us, in the House of Lords and other, to speak and to act in all sorts of different ways. It is to encourage the rich and affluent to see what really matters. Um, this is all part of working for the Lord Jesus Christ and how important it is in the world in which we live. See, uh, we, I went at one point to um, Chequers uh, with bishops to meet Margaret Thatcher, and, uh, and I said to her, look, um, Prime Minister, if you came to some of the parishes in my, in my diocese, you would find the only professional, and I use that term in that technical sense, the only professional there after five o'clock on a weekday and throughout the weekends is the clergyman and his wife who live there for Christ's sake. They know what it's like there. You listen to them, and then you'll really know what it's like in these areas. And these guys are gold dust, and their wives and families are gold dust for Jesus. And so are the people who stick there with them for the Lord Jesus to spread the gospel. She said, give me the names I want to write to them. For Christ's sake. And then the noble name in verse 7. The commentary on verses 5 to 6 is a sharp one, but it gets sharper. They say, those who say they are Christian believers and use power and position to squash and manipulate and exploit are not acting as believers in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Rather, they are slandering the noble name of him to whom they belong. Wow! Slandering the noble name of him to whom they belong. That's pretty sharp. Of course, the Jews didn't like to use the holy name. To those who believed in his name, we say in John 1. Or the apostles rejoiced because they'd been counted worthy to suffer disgrace for his name. They slandered his name. And verse 6 says, they insulted the poor. Insulted the poor. Does this hurt? I hope it does because it hurts me. The scripture is sharp in James. But so often we glide along without seeing it. And, and I think time and time again, many of you, of course, are involved in this way and this, you, you fulfill this wonderfully. Perhaps all of you, I don't know. But love is the key, verses 8 to 11. Favoritism is deeply challenged by the basic principle of the second great commandment. Um, the two commandments, of course, are reflected um, in this whole chapter. When we mentioned earlier Leviticus 19 verse 18 about justice and impartiality, it is only three verses before where uh, there is love your neighbor as yourself. And our Lord, of course, quoted that. James calls it the royal law. Ever thought why? Let me suggest to you why. You see, those who had authority had power. They set up the rules. They wrote the rule book in their favor. They therefore had it wrapped up. And if you were poor and powerless, you felt you couldn't do anything about it. And James says, but there's one thing that rides above you all, and that is an imperial edict. And this is the edict of the king of kings. And it rides over the lot of you. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has echoed this as the greatest commandments. And the greatest commandments ride over every edict you have. It is therefore the royal law of the king of kings, which overrides everything else. And he says, this Commandment is to love other people as yourself. How important that is. We love ourselves, but to reach into another person's situation. Many moons ago, we were at a house party, and I got something which is like Meniere's disease, where the whole world spun, and I was sick, and I couldn't stand up. We went on to a Christian conference, uh, a holiday hotel not so far away in Devon after that, and I rolled about the whole time, and people treated me as if I was mentally deficient. A year later, we went to set back to the same place, when I was well, of course, and I heard someone say, oh, he's really quite normal after all. <laughs> In fact, what they said is, he's quite intelligent after all. I'm thankful for that experience. My dear friends who are here, who are perhaps mentally ill, God forgive us if we ever treat you as more of less value than anybody else. 
God forgive us if you've got MS or you're an epileptic or you're blind or you're deaf if we treat you as of less value. God forgive us. Supposing I could put myself in your position. Sometimes when men are dreadful towards women, I wish I could make them change sex for a year and work it out. And vice versa. Reach to see what it would be like if I was there and not here. Because love cannot be selective. Favoritism is not in the will of God. And so he ends, and we've got to end. Uh, because you, in verse 11, you see you can be very selective. The zealots were people who would have got very angry about adultery, but they didn't hesitate to murder. And this is an important passage that really could take our time, but you see, you and I can get very upset about murder and adultery, but not so upset about bearing false witness or coveting what our neighbor has. And what this passage says, if you're going to be severe about one part of the law, remember it's the whole of the law, and you've only got to disobey one point of the law to disobey. It's a reminder how easy it is to get worked up. How can you go to mass on Sunday and kill as an IRA terrorist on Monday? Judgment and mercy, therefore, it comes to at the end. There's got to be judgment, there will be judgment, but mercy is in the end greater. The great thing is that judgment will be by the law that gives freedom in verse 12 because the parameters of God's law give us freedom to operate as human beings. But judgment without mercy is a terrible thing. When I was caught scrumping, I'm thankful for the man who took our names and tore up the paper and threw it away. He taught me a lesson in my boyhood of judgment and mercy. It's not easy ever, headmaster, bishop, or anybody who has to exercise discipline, how you do that in all sorts of walks of life the principle and the compassion. And yet, our Lord said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. He gave us the parable of the unmerciful servant. And here, James says in verse 13, mercy triumphs over judgment. In the end, yes, there must be judgment, but mercy is the greater. Because of the mercy supremely from the Lord Jesus that you and I have received, Praise his blessed name. Let us pray. Lord, your word reaches into our inner being as you promised it would do. It divides the innermost thoughts of our hearts like a two-edged sword. It comforts us, but it discomforts us. And there's so much we've thought about this morning and we pray for ourselves and for one another, the particular arenas of this which you want us to hear, we may actually hear and act upon. Lord, give us your mercy afresh and help us to be people who live to your glory as believers in the glorious Lord Jesus. For your name's sake, amen.